صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة ما خاب والله من تمسك بكم وأمنا من لجأ والتجأ إليكم يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل لمن ما في السماوات والأرض قل لله قل لله كتب على نفسه الرحمة ليجمعنكم إلى يوم القيامة لا ريب فيه الذين خسروا أنفسهم فهم لا يؤمنون وله ما سكن في الليل والنهار وهو السميع العليم قل أغير الله يتخذ وليا فاطر السماوات والأرض وهو يطعم ولا يطعم قل إني أمرت أن أكون أول من أسلم ولا تكونن من المشركين قل إني أخاف إن عصيت ربي عذاب يوم عظيم من يصرف عنه يومئذ فقد رحمه وذلك الفوز المبين 
sweeten your gathering with a remembrance of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. As a gift to the soul of Sayyidina wa Mawlana wa Habibina, Al Imam Abu Abdullah Al Hussein recite the second salawat. For Allah to shower onto this gathering with His infinite mercy and compassion and to hasten the reappearance of the ninth from the progeny of Hussein ibn Ali, recite the third salawat with the loudest of your voices. Allahumma <laughs> salli Indeed, it is the most fundamental question of our lives. Yet, it is the most intimidating question. It is the most awkward question. Yet, it is a question that exists in the minds of human beings since the inception of life on the face of this earth. Is God an illusion? Does God really exist? And if he exists, how can there be so much injustice and tyranny around the world? If God sees everything, how can he be a witness to millions of people suffering around the world? If God hears everything, does he not hear the cries of the victims of war and terror? The cries of the victims of abuse and rape? The cries of hungry children and desperate mothers? Tonight, we are here to engage in a dialogue with such ideas and thoughts. And notice I've used the word dialogue and not debate. Why? Because I truly believe that not all those individuals who question God today who have misconceptions about God, who deny God's existence, not every single one of them is evil by nature. Not every single one of them was in pursuit of darkness or to sever their ties with their Creator. In fact, I want to say this. I believe that some of them were in pursuit of the truth. Some of them were in pursuit to find the truth and they landed on the wrong freeway. And today, they're no longer identifying with Islam. Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, when he finished one of his most deadly battles known as the Battle of Nahrawan, he told his companions, don't you ever fight those guys again. The Khawarij. Why? Because those guys are in pursuit of the truth. They're in pursuit of haqq. Look at their salah. Look at their siyam. Look at their recitation of the Quran. Look at their passion and dedication to God. But they just ended up with ignorance, with darkness. They didn't find the truth. Now how that could be possible 
Super nights. But I want to say this. Not everybody today who denies the existence of God or has questions about God is necessarily an evil person. And that is why we are here to talk. We are here to exchange ideas. We're not here to fight. And unfortunately, many people within our community, especially the youth, they have such sentiments, questions, concerns. Some of them wake up one day saying, I, I don't feel God in my life. I don't feel God is relevant in my life anymore. I have serious questions about God's existence. And those are normal thoughts. Sometimes pious, righteous, practicing individuals. May encounter such ideas. A young lady, she said to me, my first encounters with such thoughts were when I was 18 years old. Her email really moved me. She said, I had 10 questions about God. Very serious questions. And I can tell she's put a lot of thought and contemplation into those questions. So say it, here are my 10 questions. I went with those questions to our local religious leadership. And I said, can you answer those 10 questions for me, please? I don't want to lose my relationship with my creator, with God. I love God. But I have those questions. And I cannot rest. I cannot sleep. I can no longer go about my life with those questions constantly reoccurring in my mind. She said, instead of my questions being answered, this individual called my parents saying, your daughter is hanging out with the wrong people. We believe she should be homeschooled. And we would like for you not to bring her to the masjid anymore because she's going to be influencing our children. And we don't want a bunch of atheist kids running around. So I was banned from the Islamic Center. I was banned from the house of God. I was banned from the religious institution. When my family came to me and said, listen, why have you been banned from the masjid? I asked them. I said, those are my concerns. My own blood relatives disowned me. They stopped speaking to me. They told my mom, don't bring her to our home when she comes. We don't want to speak to her. We don't want to see her anymore. She said, every time I spoke of such sentiments to my parents, they got so upset until one day my father came and she said to me, he said to me, you're no longer welcomed in my home. At 18 years old, I had to pick up and leave. At 18 years old, I became homeless. At 18 years old, I had to sleep in a woman's shelter. I didn't know where to go. I was lost. I was devastated. I was scared. So my 11th question to you, Sayyid, is what kind of God, intolerant, unkind God, would want me to suffer so much just because I had a few questions. Today, brothers and sisters, the issue that's driving our children to atheism, agnosticism, is not their high school atheist math teacher. 
And it's not the fact that they went and read scientific books. The initiation of the journey begins with the so-called religious policing, religious hypocrisy, religious superstition, religious double standards, from the so-called religious institution. And then they'll end up on YouTube and read a couple of articles and boom, you have a full-fledged atheist. If you read the entire Quran cover to cover, you realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in constant conversation with those who deny his existence. If all their ideas were so ludicrous, if they were a bunch of hoodlums, if they weren't worth our time and energy, why would God spend the majority of the Quran speaking to them? in dialogue with them. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Almighty, their creator, is tolerant of them, how could we drive them away from the house of Allah? How can we shut the door of mercy in their face? I want you to pay attention to this extremely delicate point right now. When we visit Imam al Hussein, what do we tell him? Assalamu alayka ya waritha adama safwatillah. Assalamu alayka ya waritha nuhin nabiyillah. Assalamu alayka ya waritha Ibrahim, ya waritha Musa, ya waritha Isa, ya waritha Muhammadin. What did Imam al-Hussein inherit from Adam? What did Imam al-Hussein inherit from Ibrahim and Nuh and Isa and Musa and his grandfather? Was it not Tawheed? Was it not the love of Allah? Was it not the mercy of Allah? Was it not the compassion of Allah? Was it not the forgiveness of Allah? Was it not to create an everlasting bond with your Creator, the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? In fact, the only way, the only way for us to be able to explain the journey of Imam al Hussein, the sacrifice of Imam al Hussein, is to say that this is an example of the greatest, most perfect relationship between man and his creator. Unconditional love. They told him, Ya Aba Abdullah, if you're leaving Medina, at least leave the children, leave the woman, because we know what's going to happen to you. Why are you taking the children, even this infant, this six month year old infant, why are you taking him? What was the response of Sayyid al-Shuhada, al-Imam Abu Abdullah al-Hussein? Sha'Allah an yarani qatilan wa an yarahunna sabaya. Allah's will, Allah's command, Allah has decided to see me as a martyr, as a shaheed. And for them to become captives. We are here to experience some of this beauty within the relationship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Imam al-Hussein. Imam al-Hussein and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His father, Amir al-Mu'mineen, says, awwalu al-deen ma'rifatullah. The very first step into faith, into religious conviction, into religious awareness, is to know Allah, to have a relationship with Allah, to create a bond between you and your Creator. That is the very first ingredient.
And we learn that when such people have such questions and thoughts and ideas, we ought to be tolerant. We ought to engage in a dialogue with understanding. Look at the biography of the very first atheist in Islam. By the way, today there is an atheist movement called Muslim Atheists going around the world, especially in North America. And the numbers are growing every single day. And they won't call themselves atheists. They'll call themselves Muslim atheists. This is not something that's happened now in the year 2022. In the time of Imam al-Sadiq, there was a school of thought by the name of Daysaniya. Daysaniya. The very first atheist school of thought in Islam. Abu Shakir al-Daysani was their founder their organizer, their mastermind. And his teacher was Abdul Karim ibn Abil Awja. Go read their biography. Those people were the founders of atheism amongst Muslims. And within the biography of Ibn Abil Awja, it has nothing to, to do with the biography of Imam al-Sadiq to say the Shia wrote the biography of Imam al-Sadiq. The lovers of Sadiq wrote his biography. No. Read the biography of Ibn Abi al -Awja. In his biography, they say he constantly had debates and dialogue with Ja'far ibn Muhammad. And he only had respect for one single Muslim scholar and that was Ja'far ibn Muhammad. And he actually defended Imam al-Sadiq when people spoke ill of him. So they told him, what kind of atheist are you, man? How can you defend Ja'far al-Sadiq? when you're an atheist. He said, I don't defend him because he believes in God or he believes in Muhammad or he believes in Islam. I stand in his defense because he's an honorable man. Because he's a respectful man. So Abu Shakir al-Daysani told him, take me to him. I want to see why you're so infatuated with him. He came back. When they came back, he told Ibn he said, if honor and respect and dignity and morality was to be confined in a man, it would be him. One day, Ibn Abil Awja, this atheist, who had a school of thought, who was inviting people to atheism, went into the presence of Imam al-Sadiq. He said to him, he asked him a question and he said to him, Yabna Rasulillah or the grandson, or the son of Rasulullah. So Imam Sadiq laughed. He said, what kind of atheist are you? You're calling me the son of Rasulullah? You don't even believe in Allah. How can you call me? He said, it is the charisma that you have. It is the akhlaq that you have that teaches me to speak with you with respect. One day this man, imagine where he was. He was right next to the Kaaba, inviting people to atheism. His friends told him, is there anybody amongst the Muslims that we can debate who would answer our questions about the so-called contradictions of the Qur'an? He pointed to Imam al-Sadiq. He said, only this man is tolerant enough to speak with you, to answer your questions, to be respectful with you. Today, those people are not outsiders that have such questions, such sentiments. Sometimes they are within our family instead of kicking them out of the house, instead of sending them to a woman's shelter, instead of turning them into homeless individuals, let us embrace them and answer their questions. Let us learn from Imam al-Sadiq. One day, Buhlul, I unfortunately don't have time to introduce to the younger audience who Buhlul was, but go look him up. Buhlul was a guy, he was, resembled me a lot. So uh, he was a weirdo going around. And people always, you know, uh, made fun of him. So one day he was passing next to a masjid. The alim who was supposed to give the lecture wasn't there on time. 
So they told him, Buhlul, why don't you take the mimbar and you say a few words? They wanted to mock him and get a laugh out of him. So Buhlul said, yes, sure. He sat in the mimbar, said, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Oh Allah, you know I love you and I care about you a lot. So please don't get ill. Take care of yourself. Don't get sick. Because if you get sick, who's going to treat you? Who's going to take you to the hospital? And then you're going to die. And if you die, we're going to be godless. And then if we're godless, what's going to happen to us? We're going to be lost. So they said, Buhlul, enough, please. He said, aren't you going to ask me how and why? He said, okay, tell us. He said, of course, I know God the Almighty doesn't get sick and he doesn't die. But where does God reside? God resides here. And sometimes he gets sick and we don't treat him. We don't take him to the hospital. We don't take care of him. He becomes terminally, uh, terminally ill and then he dies. And then we become godless. And do you know how people become godless and how God dies? They said, no, he said, because of you guys. Yes, indeed. Sometimes the way we portray God, the way we define God, the picture that people have of God in their minds, it's full of contradictions. It's full of problems. We don't even, we shouldn't even believe in such a God. A God that's always waiting there for us to make a mistake so that he can strike us and destroy us and punish us. A God that handpicks a few individuals and he loves them and he hates everyone else. If you hate me, why did you create me? While there are illegitimate children, according to society, there is no illegitimate people according to God. God has a plan for every single one of us. And that is why we are on, we are on the face of the earth. And that is why we exist. And he listens to every one of us. And he hears and is a witness to every single one of us. Let me go back to the original question. Is God an illusion? Does God really exist? Is God relevant in our lives today? To sum up the response from the atheists, which is absolutely not, God does not exist, there is no need for a God. To sum it up, we'll say this. Priests, scholars, messengers, prophets, people who spoke of God, why did they speak of God? They told people to repent from sin when there was famine. They told people to pray to God when there was war. They told people to embrace God when there was hunger and starvation. When they, when they didn't know any better. They thought that God was going to be the solution to their problems. But today, we don't need God to end war. We don't need God to end famine. We don't need God to end starvation. We don't need God to eliminate illnesses and bacteria and pandemics. In fact, human beings are on their way to defy death. And there are three areas, there are three areas which I want to focus on. Number one, the last days of war. A lot of people claim today that soon enough there will be no more wars. It is the last days that human beings will ever engage in war. Why? Because at a time, people would fight with swords and chop each other's heads off. Then there were bombs and atomic bombs and they would bomb each other and destroy each other. But today, at the time of peace, 
There is something called logic bombs. Logic bombs are malicious software installed in uh, your local dams, your train stations, your airports, your electricity grids. And whenever there is war, guess what? They are remotely put into effect. So you could be sitting here in Michigan and you lose your lights. Why? Because some guy in North Korea switched on some button and we lost our electricity. Or turned off our power grid. Or we end up colliding our train station. There, there is a collision in our train station because there is something called a logic bomb that is installed in computers that control every aspect of our lives today. So instead of praying to God to end war, go and create a software, get that software ready, and when there is war, just use it. Nobody's going to be using bombs anymore. In fact, all the wars of the modern world will be conducted online. You hack them and they hack you, and as long as you know how to hack, you're good. Every year, 50 to 60 million people die around the world, okay? 120,000 of them only die because of war. And that is why human beings, through modern technology, are putting an end to the era of war. Very good. Number two, the end of famine, the end of illness, the end of pandemics. In the 1500s, there was a ship that sailed from Cuba towards Mexico with 900 soldiers, Spanish soldiers, and a biological time bomb known as the smallpox, right? They arrived to Mexico. Mexico's population at the time was 22 million. Within 50 years of plague, after pandemics, after illnesses, the population of Mexico dropped to less than 2 million people. Imagine. The whole population vanished. But now, the World Health Organization has declared that humanity has won over smallpox. And many other illnesses. When a plague in the 1600s hit France while King Louis was in Versailles enjoying his mistresses, one-fifth or a fifth of the population of France was annihilated. But today, with the help of vaccines, you can overcome anything. In fact, scientists are creating nanorobots that will engage in your bloodstream and they'll go and they'll find whatever illness there is and they'll fix the problem. So human beings are overcoming illnesses and pandemics. And if you talk about hunger, today, as we speak, more people are dying from obesity than hunger around the world. You're more likely to die from eating too much McDonald's today or junk food than you are to die from hunger and starvation. Every year, 1.5 million people die from diabetes. So sugar is the new gunpowder. And while Google is offering so many solutions to humanity, look at the list of the accomplishments of Apple, Microsoft, Google, what are the accomplishments of religion? What are the accomplishments of Islam or God or Christianity? Google's CEO in a recent interview said that if you ask me if human beings 
can live up to 500 years, I'll tell you, yes, it's possible. And we have allocated 30% of our wealth and research to defy death. Why? Because the number one enemy of human beings is death. And we have declared a full-fledged war against death. And we will define death. And by 2100, a human being will live 150 years. By 2200, you will live 500 years. So while Google is defying death, what has Islam offered? Christianity. Therefore, we don't need God. God is absolutely irrelevant. While people needed solutions, they wanted to pray to God, please remove us from famine and war and, and hunger and starvation. Today, we have the solution. We found it. And we're working towards it. Fortunately, I don't have time, so I'm going to engage in my response. I hope I did justice to what they're offering. Imagine, when is the World Cup in Qatar? How many months from now? A few months from now. Imagine you've made it to the finals. Imagine you've made it to the finals. It's the last game. It's the 90th minute. And one of you brothers here, on the very last minute, scores the winning goal. Wow. All your teammates are running towards you to hug you and kiss you. And the entire stadium erupts like a volcano, cheering and crying. People back here in Dearborn are crying, calling your parents, Abudi. He made us so proud. And you're static, you're so happy, you're joyful. You've won the World Cup. That is the good news. You're going to be very happy, very joyful. But the bad news is it's downhill from there. Why? Because no moment of joy and bliss lasts forever. Even scoring the winning goal in the World Cup. Can Google offer us a solution for that? Why are there millions of people around the world taking their lives every day? Every year, millions of people commit suicide. Young, why would I want to live 500 years when there is so much anxiety and depression and suicide? I would rather live shorter years but with happiness, with joy, with comfort, with tranquility. Why is there so much immorality around the world? Why are there people trying to make a trillion dollars while there are other people who don't have bread to eat and clean water to drink? Can Google give us an answer for that? Why are there people, human beings, willing to create drugs and sell it to children so that they can become wealthy while destroying families and lives? Can Google give us a solution for that? Microsoft, Apple, modern world, please tell us. How can we live in constant joy and bliss, contentment? Allah has the solution. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ala bi dhikrillahi this heart can occupy all kinds of love and passions and for, for this world. You'll buy five Ferraris and you'll want ten. You'll, want, you'll have five homes and you'll want ten. You'll have a big mansion and you'll want a bigger one. You'll never stop. You'll never be content. And we are seeing the example in our lives today. There is a person with a trillion dollars 
who wants more. People are now becoming billionaires and they want more. Look at the greed of human beings. When will we say enough is enough? And of course, I don't agree that we've ended war. Look at the people of Yemen. Yes, because you don't care for them because they obviously don't exist to you. There's an ongoing war. There's people dying and starving to death. Nobody cares for them. How can we... There are people who are born in the streets and die in the streets in the millions in India. There are people who do not have clean drinking water to drink. That is when societies morally corrupt. That's when they have forgotten about God and religious values. And by religious values, I don't mean, you know, if you sell paradise with dollars and cents. And I don't mean a God that wants to uh, terminate whoever does not believe in him and destroy whoever rejects him. No, I don't mean that kind of God, but I mean the God of Imam al Hussein, the God of Abu Abdullah al Hussein, And this is why those majalis are important, brothers and sisters. Because this majalis is a gateway to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because I want to familiarize myself with the Allah of Imam al Hussein, who Imam al Hussein was willing to give everything he has, even in those last moments when he was in the ditch, thirst, hunger, he's lost everyone. He knows that they've already attacked his tents, but he says, Ilahi, ridan bi ridak, la ma'abuda siwak. إِلَٰهِ إِنْ كَانَ هَذَا يُرْضِيكَ فَخُذْ حَتَّى تَرْضَىٰ O oh Allah, if this is what pleases you, then what am I? Take. Take until you are pleased and you are satisfied. Every time a calamity fell onto him, even his infant, what does he say? قَدْ هَوَّنَ مَا نَزَلَ بِي بِأَنَّهُ فِي عَيْنِ اللَّهِ it brings ease to me. It makes it easy for me because I know God is watching. God is there. He does not neglect me. He is not forgetful of me. In the time of Salah, they came to him. They said, Ya Aba Abdullah, on the 10th of Muharram, in the midst of the battlefield, Ya Aba Abdullah, it is the time for Salah. He says, I've missed having a conversation with Allah. It is time for salah. Let us stand up and pray. This God that you yearn to talk to, you find in the school of Hussein. It's not that you should be forced to pray. You should be reminded to pray. In the school of Hussein, you're counting the hours for the time of salah so that you stand up and you have a conversation with Allah. Go and find that Allah. My younger brothers and sisters, those who are watching all around the world, let me tell you something. Do not ever let anyone and anything come between you and a relationship with Allah and that bond with Allah. If it's your parents, if it's your friends, if it's your work, if, whatever it is, because the most meaningful thing in your life is that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is your only friend. He is your true friend. You see, when you are at a young age, you might not know this. But as you grow older, you will realize Allah is the only friend you can depend on. Because He loves you more than your own mother and your own father. Your parents may neglect you. They forget about you. Maybe they can't even help you. But Allah can and He's willing and he will always be there for you. And he's your only loyal friend. And he is your only true friend. And he's the only one that listens to you 24-7. And he will never shut his door in your face. Not your friends on Facebook. Not your followers on Instagram. Allah is that true friend. And this is where you learn in the school of Imam al Hussein That Allah is not an illusion. Allah is real. 
And he is always relevant in every second of your life he is relevant. Look at Imam al Hussein. Beheaded, killed, has families taken as captives in the midst of the deserts. Who would think that Imam al Hussein, nobody would even know what happened to him? If you were there on that day, you would say, most certainly Hussein will be forgotten. But Allah was with Hussein. Allah took the side of Hussein. And look at Hussein today. Look at him today. He has so many friends. Look at the family of Hussein today. A family in the hundreds of millions. Every color, every nationality, every language, every ethnicity, every age. Today, they gather to show their love for Imam al Hussein. To tell him, Ya Sayyidi, Ya Aba Abdullah. We wish we were there on the 10th of Muharram so that we can go there, so that we can be a sacrifice. We can go before you. We can defend you. So that you would not be left alone on the 10th of Muharram saying, Ala hal min nasirin yansuruna. Ala hal min mu'inin yu'inuna. Is there anybody to come to, your, to our rescue? Allah rewarded Hussein with the most loyal of friends, most loving of friends, most generous of friends, most resilient of friends and followers. Because Allah was with Hussein. And he remains with Hussein. This is why we gather in those nights, brothers and sisters. To get to know the creator and the Lord of Hussein who forgave Hur. Hur. Hur who intercepted the camp of Hussein. Who was the cause of the misery for Hussein. When he came to him, he said to him, Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. Imam al Hussein didn't say, What are you doing here? Look what you've caused. How can I forgive you? How can you even have the audacity to come and speak with me? Imam al Hussein says, Man ant, who are you? Imam al Hussein knew him because Hur was praying behind Imam al Hussein every day. But he wanted to see how Hur is going to introduce himself. So he said, Yabna Rasulullah, my name doesn't matter anymore. And who am I doesn't matter anymore. I tell you who I am. I am that criminal. And today in our community, in our homes, you won't find criminals with a crime bigger than Hur. I am the one who's caused all of this. Imam al Hussein says, Tubta Ballahu alayk. Two words in one split second. Hur was forgiven. Those majalis lead you to that Allah that forgave Hur in a split second, though he was the biggest criminal. And he turned Hur into who he is today. So that when you visit Hussein and you say, Assalamu ala al Husseini wa ala Ali ibn al Hussein wa ala awlad al Hussein. وَعَلَىٰ أَصْحَابِ الْحُسَيْنِ يُسْلُوتْ حُرْ Ibn Yazid al-Riyahi This is what Hur can, this is what the school of Hussein can do to us and for us to turn into a criminal, a sinful person into a saint within a split second. On his last moments when Shimr sat on the chest of Aba Abdullah Imam al Hussein was crying. Why was he crying? Was he afraid? Wallah, how can Hussein be afraid? Hussein says, If all the Arabs draw their swords and they face me, I will not give them my back. Not Hussein. Children in the camp of Hussein 
We're not afraid of death. How do you find death, O Qasim? Sweeter than honey. Why was he crying? He says, I cry because all those people will be punished because of me. This is Hussein's Lord. This is Allah. And this Allah is not an illusion. So he says to him, Shimr, fetch me water. Do you think Imam al Hussein wanted water? It's a matter of seconds, and he will be quenched by Allah. But Imam al Hussein saw what Shimr was doing. He wanted to rescue him just like he rescued Hur. Maybe if he goes and fetches him water, he's not going to sit on his chest. He's not going to behead him. He wanted to give him a chance, even Shimr. This is Hussein. And the majalis of Hussein lead us to this Allah that gave morality to Hussein. And this love relationship between man and his creator is found only in the school of Hussein. That is why we come to him tonight and we send our hearts and our souls towards Karbala. As you saw, the flag on top of this building has changed to a red flag that says, Ya Hussein. What does this mean? This means that, O oh Hussein, we're all your soldiers. A soldier of Hussein will not bring shame to Hussein on the day of judgment, by the way. By sinning. A servant and a soldier of Hussein defies sin because he knows this is what pleases Hussein. I don't go towards sin because I know that is going to embarrass my imam. A soldier of Imam al Hussein, as a person who runs away sin, runs away from sin like he would run away from plague and diseases. Because he wants to keep this body and this soul pure for his master, Sayyid al Shuhada, Abi Abdullah al Hussein. So we send our hearts, we send our bodies towards Karbala. Place your hands on your hearts and raise your voice with me. يا سيدنا وماولانا إنا توجهنا واستشفعنا وتوسلنا بك إلى الله وقدمناك Brothers and sisters, it is the first night of Muharram. We are in Aza with Fatima, with his grandfather Rasulullah, with his father Amir al Mu'mineen. Release your voice. Let this voice be free for Imam al Hussein. Raise your voice together. Ya wajihan inda Allah. اشفع لنا عند الله يا وجيها One more time, louder. يا وجيها عند الله Now all of us together, we salute him. We salute him on the first night for his sacrifice. As-salamu ala al-Husayn wa ala Ali ibn al وعلى أصحاب الحسين جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته. Brothers, tonight is the most special night if you ask me. Those who are here today have written their names in the front and the beginning of the list 
of those who have come to establish their aza' with Fatima to Zahra. Fatima salutes you at the door. She tells you, welcome to the aza' of my son Hussein. Thank you for joining me at the aza' of my son Hussein. Rasulullah greets you. And on the day of judgment, your names will be read as the first individuals because you came here first. So I want you all together to raise your voice now to tell him, Ya Aba Abdullah, indeed we are your soldiers. We are ready for your son, Al Imam Al Mahdi. And we are always going to chant this until the last moment of our lives. Labbayka ya Hussein, Labbayka ya Hussein. لبيك يا حسين لبيك يا حسين لبيك لبيك يا حسين Brothers sitting in the back, sisters, all of us together, I want you to shake this building. This is a massive crowd. لبيك يا حسين لبيك يا لبيك يا حسين One more time. لبيك يا حسين Now imagine yourself for a moment in front of the shrine of Aba Abdullah while they're changing the flag. You've all seen the videos. One more time, last time, with all the Shia and the lovers of Hussein around the world. لبيك يا حسين لبيك يا حسين لبيك يا حسين إمام الحسين on this night for moments I want to remind you of how Imam al-Hussein spent his last day in Medina Allahu Akbar when he knew that he has to leave the city of Medina he went towards the shrine of his grandfather Rasulullah this is what history tells us he ended up next to the shrine of his grandfather. He cried. He says, Ya Jadda, Dhammani Ya Jadda, Andaka fi hadha al-dhariha. Ya Rasulullah, allow me to enter into this grave. And my miseries, I miss you, Ya Rasulullah. He cried until he went to sleep. When he went to sleep, he saw his grandfather, Rasulullah, in his dream. This is what the poet says when he speaks of the dialogue between Imam al Hussein and his grandfather, Rasulullah. <laughs> علني جد من بل وزماني أستري فعلى فعلى من جانب القبر بكاء ونحيب ونداء بافتجاع يا حبيبي يا حسين His grandfather responds to him from the grave. He says to him, Ya Habibi, Ya Hussein, listen to me. This is what Allah has prescribed for you. أنت يا ريحانة القلب حقيق بالبلاء إنما الدنيا أعدت لبلاء الأولياء yeah, oh my son, oh yeah, Abba Abdullah, this life is meant to be a challenge for the believers, for the pious. 
And oh, my beloved Hussein, you're at the peak of Iman. Then he says to him, Karbala. Oh, my grandson, you will taste death at its worst where in the deserts of Karbala while you are thirsty. And you will remain on its soil. You will remain on its soil for three days under the sun. Then what does he tell him? Excuse me for saying this. Then 